We're going to get right into this tonight. If you don't have a copy of the syllabus, hold up your hand and we'll get you one. Boy, by now you got a thick, thick book. And this is the last installment. Turn to the last page of your notes. This tells you about next Wednesday night. We start a whole brand new study called Tents, Temples, and Palaces. And there for the next uh, 10 Wednesday nights, Lord willing, you'll see what we're going to do. It's divided into three parts as we're studying the Old Testament. You need to know the Old Testament. Greatest stories in the world are in the Old Testament. I mentioned in one of the services over the weekend that last uh, week we had our executive presbytery meeting in Branson, and there's a new theater that's just opened in Branson called the Sight and Sound Show. I wish I could put you all on an airplane and take you up there. It's owned by a wonderful Mennonite brother whose name is Eshelman. He has a theater just like it that's been in existence now for about 15 years in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where they put on the greatest stage shows of Bible stories you'll find anywhere in the world. It's my understanding that Mr. Eshelman put out about $50 million for this theater and its production. <clears throat> and the production going on right now is Noah. There are always Christian, biblical, epics, stage dramas. And I told the folks here uh, last uh, Sunday in one of the services, early, early service, I think, that the auditorium is just slightly bigger than this one. This one seats about 2,000. He's got 2,200 seats in it. And um, let's just suppose now you're facing the stage here, and uh, the stage is 300 and, th and either 30 or 50 feet wide. That's a little longer than a football field and it wraps around. So it would probably go from the two exit signs back here, clear around. So when it's all open up, you're in it, 350 feet. And when the second act opens, they open up the whole thing and you are inside the ark, which is 40 some feet high. It's the same dimensions as the one in scripture. You're inside it and you are surrounded by the animals and Noah and his family and the incredible music and the lighting. Some of the animals are real animals, some are animatronic, but it takes your breath away. And they do these fabulous biblical stories. The greatest stories in the world are Old Testament stories, Ten Commandments. I mean, these, these are great, great stories. So we're going to study the lives of some of the most incredible people who've ever lived in these next 10 weeks. And we open it up with God's ways and God's words. How do we know what we have is really the word of God, the history of the human race. And uh, I'll tell you some of the early stories that I knew when it got started. And uh, the history of God's chosen people. Why has God's favor been with the Jews down through all these years? And what is it with them in the Old Testament? The history of faith and worship, a home for the people of God. You're going to know Israel backwards and forwards. The kingdom united under David and Solomon. Boy, there are two characters, two characters. Saul was the first king of Israel, and then David, and then Solomon, and then the kingdom got split in two over the issue of taxes. And one kingdom went north and one kingdom went south. So we'll study about a kingdom divided. A kingdom divided. We're going to talk about the judgment and captivity. Nebuchadnezzar, the greatest king of antiquity, whom Saddam Hussein wanted to emulate, and he didn't quite get there. And uh, it's just going to, and I'll give you a syllabus every Wednesday night, and you're going to know the Old Testament well when we get to writings like Obadiah. Why, wow, Pastor, I didn't know there was an Obadiah. <laughs> Some lady stopped me one day. I hope she wasn't a member here. She said, I just know the Bible backwards and forwards. I said, oh, I'm so thrilled to hear that. I said, you know, I was just reading over in Hezekiah the other day, and she said, that's my favorite book. <laughs> and I said, there is no such book. <laughs> I think she was from <clears throat> McGregor Baptist, but... Uh, <laughs>
Maybe not. Anybody here from McGregor, please tell Dr. Powell I said that. Would you do? <laughs> so I encourage you to be here next Wednesday night. Okay, the coming universe as God sees it. You see a little review on page one between lines 12 and 25. We have reached now the end of the seven-year tribulation cycle, time of God's wrath. Remember, it's not man's wrath, it's God's wrath. God's anger against the world that has rejected his plan of salvation. And God has poured out the seal judgments. Remember, God held this judgment, the scroll of judgment in his hand. It was sealed with seven seals. These are the seals that David Koresh told his followers in Waco. Only he knew what they meant. That's not true. That's a lie. Any child in our Sunday school ought to be able to tell you what those seals were. And Jesus began to peel those seals off the scroll. And every time he did, there was a horrific supernatural divine judgment on this earth. Then came the trumpet judgments and then the vial like a test tube. Every time one was broken, it poured out contents of horrendous eternal poison on this earth. Then we saw the rise of Antichrist and his henchmen, the false prophet, take control of most of the earth's nations with the resulting one world religion and a strong global economy. I can uh, remember when uh, the dollar was very strong. It's not strong in much of the world today. Uh, it's, I think a euro is a buck sixty, isn't it? Right now, right at that, a dollar sixty. I can remember when we used to get a couple euros for a dollar, dollar ten. Now it's a dollar sixty per euro. The cost, the Israeli shekel is as strong, if not, it's stronger than the dollar. And we are headed for a global world economy so fast it makes your head swim. And you have to have the 666 to buy and sell, remember? Now, verse uh, uh, line 20, as the end nears, we've seen the world religion and the economy crash, the two heinous Babylons that we studied. Then the nations meet to fight at Armageddon. The Lord Jesus returns to earth, smiting the nations, rescuing the Jews from their tormentors. This is from Zechariah 14. That would make you a great movie, Jeff, Zechariah 14. Wow. Now King Jesus takes control of all things on planet Earth for a thousand years. Hallelujah. We're going to rule and reign with Christ on this earth for a thousand years. What happens after that, Pastor? Then it gets better. Then it gets better. Revelation chapter 20, verse 1 to 15. You can either follow along in your script or in your Bible, or you can watch the screen. Chapter 20 of Revelation. I saw an angel come down from heaven, carrying the key to the deep pit and a big chain. He chained the dragon for a thousand years. There's that old snake who is also known as the devil and Satan. Then the angel threw the dragon into the pit. He locked and sealed it so that a thousand years would go by before the dragon could fool the nations again. But after that, it would have to be set free for a little while. I saw thrones, and sitting on those thrones were the ones who had been given the right to judge. I also saw the souls of the people who had their heads cut off because they had told about Jesus and preached God's message. They were the same ones who had not worshipped the beast or the idol, and they had refused to let its mark be put on their hands or foreheads. They will come to life and rule with Christ for a thousand years. These people are the first to be raised to life, and they are especially blessed and holy. 
the second death has no power over them. They will be priests for God and Christ and will rule with them for a thousand years. No other dead people were raised to life until a thousand years later. At the end of the thousand years, Satan will be set free. He will fool the countries of Gog and Magog, which are at the far ends of the earth. And their people will follow him into battle. They will have as many followers as there are grains of sand along the beach. And they will march all the way across the earth. They will surround the camp of God's people and the city that his people love. Fire will come down from heaven and destroy the whole army. Then the devil who fooled them will be thrown into the lake of fire and burning sulfur. He will be there with the beast and the false prophet, and they will be in pain day and night forever and ever. I saw a great white throne with someone sitting on it. Earth and heaven tried to run away, but there was no place for them to go. I also saw all the dead people standing in front of that throne. Every one of them was there, no matter who they had once been. Several books were opened. Then the book of life was opened. The dead were judged by what those books said they had done. The sea gave up the dead people who were in it, and death in its kingdom also gave up their dead. Then everyone was judged by what they had done. Afterwards, death and its kingdom were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Anyone whose name wasn't written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Okay, page number two, we're down at line 28. We have come to the moment, uh, as we finished our study five weeks ago, of the second coming of Christ. This is not the rapture. The rapture is when we meet the Lord in the air. That could come at any moment. But this is the second coming of Christ, when Jesus' feet actually come back and touch this earth. We learn in Zechariah chapter 14, the first thing our Lord is going to do is go into the lands that have hounded the Jewish people, that were Antichrist and Satan, have hounded the Jewish people, and he's going to liberate his people to go back into Israel. He will set his feet on Mount Zion, or Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives will split in two, and uh, the battle will be raging at Armageddon, which is only the eye of the storm. The battle will really be all over mi the Middle East. And Jesus, with the word of his mouth, will declare victory, and all of the forces will be put down with the word of his mouth. At the return of Christ, Satan's dominion on earth, and all the people that he has hounded for so long will be bound for a thousand years. I mention here that Satan is not just a force. He is a very real person. That gets minimized in uh, media today. It gets minimized in the pulpit a lot today. But Satan is a very real person. He's very evil. He is the stronghold of all evil. He is a created being. The fact that he is a person and that he is a created being means he is not divine. He is strong, he's stronger than you are, but not if you have Christ in your heart. If you have Christ in your heart, you're in good hands. But he's a created, very strong, very evil being. As a created being, he can only be at one place at one time. I want to emphasize that. Satan can only be at one place at one time. He is not omnipresent. He is not omniscient. He has limited powers. So if Satan is in Manila, 
tonight. He cannot be in Fort Myers. Now, he has many helpers, many, many helpers. Some of them are demonic spirits. Some of them are human spirits. He has a lot of help. But Satan himself has diminished power. He is not God. Christians make two mistakes when it comes to Satan. One is an overestimating him, and the other is an underestimating him. But Christians who know the word put him in his proper place. Uh, the word devil is mentioned 35 times in Scripture, 52 times. He is called Satan, which means enemy or adversary. In Ezekiel 28, we get a good concept of Satan, who he is, the power that he has. Uh, Ezekiel here is addressing by the power of the Holy Spirit the king of Tyre, which is Lebanon today, but by law of double reference, he's really speaking to the most evil one who is Satan. And he talks about him. I'm going to read this to you. Son of man, he called Ezekiel that a hundred times in that book. Son of man, weep for the king of Tyre. Give him the message from the sovereign Lord. Now here's where Satan was when he was created. You were the perfection of wisdom and beauty. You were that. You're not anymore. When Satan commanded the rebellion against God, he took fully one-third of all the created angels with him and launched this rebellion against God, thinking he was God. And God, hardly with a flip of his fingers, threw Satan and all those one-third of the sinning angels out of heaven. You were the perfection of wisdom and beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Your clothing was adorned with every precious stone, red carnelian, chrysolite, white moonstone, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald, all beautifully crafted for you and set in the finest gold. They were given to you on the day you were created. Some theologians believe that Satan was the head over all the angels. Don't know that from Scripture, but it's surmised that he could have been. I ordained and anointed you as the mighty angelic guardian. You had access to the holy mountain of God. You walked among the stones of fire. You were blameless in all you did from the day you were created until the day evil was found in you. Your great wealth filled you with violence and you sinned. So I banished you from the mountain of God. I expelled you. O oh, mighty guardian from your place among the stones of fire. Your heart was filled with pride because of all your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth and exposed you to the curious gaze of kings. You defiled your sanctuaries with your many sins and your dishonest trade. So I brought fire from within you and it consumed you. I let it burn you to ashes on the ground in the sight of all who were watching. All who knew you are appalled at your fate. You have come to a terrible end, and you are no more. On line 24, I asked the question, how did Satan become evil? Did God create evil? No, but God created Satan as he created you with a free moral choice or volition as theologians call it. You were given the right to choose. God did not make you a robot. If he'd have wanted you to be a robot, he'd have created you so you just were an automaton. And When God said jump, you jumped. If God said run, you ran. But he made you with a mind of your own. He wanted you to worship him because you wanted to, not because you were compelled to. So he had a free moral will. Selfish pride is the raw material of sinful behavior. You ought to un underline that. Selfish pride is the raw material of sinful behavior. Now line 28, at the return of Christ, one angel, one angel, not a mighty legion of angels, but one angel takes Satan. Satan no longer has any power. He's been stripped of it. And Antichrist binds them and pitches them into hell for a thousand years. He will deceive neither nations nor individuals anymore. 
this point, Satan is thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Sometimes, uh, almost in jest, Satan is referred to as, uh, as uh, the king of hell. People go to hell and they're confronted by Satan. Satan's not going to be the king of hell. Not on your life. Jesus is the Lord of hell. Satan is an inmate. And Jesus is the warden. Don't overestimate Satan, who he is. And hell is not going to be his domain. We are told in Scripture that there will be worship in hell, not of our own volition, but those who are there by an act of God, a decree, will be made to worship God. So don't think you're going to run away from God just by going into hell. It's not going to be a very pleasant place, and it's a very real place with real people in it. You don't ever hear much about hell in media today. Years and years ago, before his uh, difficulties, I had coffee one day with uh, Jimmy Swaggart, and he told me an interesting thing. It takes so much money to be on television in these days, and on that basis, not the way we do it, but on the basis they do it. And um, in order to get the money coming in, you have to have people write to you. You've got to have the ratings. And Jimmy said, if I preach on the love of God, the grace of God, if I preach on prosperity, the money flows in. It was coming in at the rate of 2 and $3 million a week. He said, if I preach on hell, we'll be lucky to get half that the next week. People don't want to hear about hell. They want to hear about happy, 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 happy. And thank God there is happy, 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 but there's also a hell. With real people, it's a real place. It needs to be front and center in our minds all the time. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. Now we come to the resurrection of the tribulation saints. Remember that during the tribulation, a lot of people are going to give their lives in order to be saved. Before the rapture takes place, Jesus gave his life so we can be saved. But in the seven-year tribulation period, if you're going to get right with God, it's probably going to cost you your head because you won't take the mark of the beast. And again, I reiterate, this is just my personal thought. This is not Assemblies of God theology, but it's sure logical to me. My goodness, friend, if you can't live for Jesus Christ in America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, where you have free access to churches all across America. Someone told me one time there's about a half a million churches in America. They're all open. They're all legal to you. If you can't live for Jesus in America now in this republic, what in the world makes you think you could live for Jesus in the tribulation when it will probably be a march to the guillotine? And it's my own personal belief that anyone who's already heard the story of Jesus and rejected it probably will not be saved in the tribulation. But we've already heard tonight about the billion people who've never heard the name of Jesus. And, and multitudes of people are going to be saved in the tribulation time, mainly through the ministry of those 144,000 sealed Jewish witnesses. And uh, they're going to pay for their lives with that. Now we come to the time when the, uh, when the resurrection takes place of the righteous tribulation dead. Line 13, the redeemed who come out of their graves at the rapture, but now the tribulation saints. Two phases to the resurrection of the righteous dead. But technically, both phases, the rapture and the resurrection post-trib, those two resurrections technically are the first resurrection. You don't want to be in the second resurrection. Anyone who's resurrected in the first wave, either at the rapture or at the end of this tribulation time, will be resurrected to life and glory and eternity with God. That's the first resurrection. And the prototype for the first resurrection was Jesus the first fruits, that's King James for prototype. 
Jesus was the prototype of those who came up out of the grave. Hallelujah. So now the tribulation saints come up. Revelation 20, verse 5, there on line 19, this is the first resurrection. The rest, those who died, who died outside of Christ, did not come back to life until the thousand years had ended. That's why John adds this thought in verse 6, line 22. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now notice a startling development. Revelation 20, verses 7 to 10. When the thousand years, the millennium, is over, Satan will be led out of prison. He will go out to deceive the nations from every corner of the earth, which are called Gog and Magog. He will gather them together for battle. A mighty host as numberless as the sand along the shore. And I saw them as they went up the broad plain of the earth and surrounded God's people and the beloved city. But fire from heaven came down on the attacking armies and consumed them. Verse 10, then the devil who betrayed them was thrown into the lake of fire again, this time permanently, that burns with sulfur, joining the beast and false prophet. There they will be tormented day and night forever. Page five, why is Satan released? Why does Jesus let him off the hook like that? After a thousand years of peace, no violence, no sin, why does Jesus let Satan get out of jail? Gives him a get out of jail free card. Because for a thousand years during the millennium, the nations have followed Christ because they didn't have any choice. Now God gives them the choice. Jesus or Satan? Jesus or Barabbas? Oh, pastor, they'd never choose Satan after a thousand years of that. Just like the people chose Barabbas, you bet they will. They, if they're not redeemed in their hearts, if they've just been serving God because they had to, it's the law of the millennium, you bet they will. But the close of the millennium, eternity will begin, and only those who have chosen of their own free will to follow Christ will receive eternal life. And amazingly, even after a thousand years, a multitude that cannot be numbered will want Satan and they follow him. And Satan leads them in an attack on Jerusalem where God finally says, that's it. And the encroaching mob is destroyed by fire from heaven and you will never hear from Satan again, ever, ever. I like to repeat what I heard an evangelist say. It might have been Dwight Thompson who said years ago, next time Satan gets to bugging you about your past, you remind him of his future. <laughs> and that ought to end that. Now we come to the millennium. When I was a little boy, my dad gave me a picture, and I've lost it. I wish I could find it. <clears throat> it's a wonderful line drawing of Daniel uh, not in the lion's den this time, but out of the lion's den. And on one hand, he's got a lion. And on the other hand, he's got a tiger or something like that. And he's just leading them along a forest path like they're little puppy dogs. And it's a picture of the millennium. I've always wanted to be in the millennium. I've always wanted a pet lion. Always. I love lions. I want to have a pet lion. And I want to encourage all the pit bull owners to bug me. <laughs> I'm just getting such great movies in my mind of this. <laughs> Isaiah 65, verses 17 to 25. The Holy Spirit tells us about this thousand years. Look, God says, I'm creating new heavens and a new earth, so wonderful that no one will even think about the old ones anymore. Be glad, rejoice forever in my creation. And look, I will create Jerusalem as a place of happiness. Her people will be a source of joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. And the sound of weeping and crying will be heard no more. Now listen to this. No longer will babies die when only a few days old. My older brother died when he was four days old. 
No longer will adults die before they've lived a full life. No longer will people be considered old at 100. Hey, out there, that was a great time for you to say something. <laughs> Only sinners will die that young at 100. In those days, people will live in the houses they build and eat the fruit of their own vineyards. It will not be like the past when invaders took the houses and confiscated the vineyards. For my people will live as long as trees. <laughs> you know, there's one old olive tree in the Garden of Gethsemane <clears throat> that uh, people who know that subject pretty well think is 18 or 1900 years old. It could have been there when Jesus was there. You'll be as old as trees. Wow, that's pretty good, isn't it? They will live as long as trees, and they will have time to enjoy their hard-won gains. They will not work in vain, and their children will not be doomed to misfortune. For they are people blessed by the Lord, and their children too will be blessed. I will answer them before they even call to me. While they are still talking to me about their needs, I will go ahead and answer their prayers. The wolf and lamb will feed together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. Poisonous snakes will strike no more. <laughs> That's really interesting to me. <clears throat> In those days, no one will be hurt or destroyed on my holy mountain. I, the Lord, have spoken. It's going to be for a thousand years, good friend. Here's some vital factors of the thousand-year earthly reign of Christ. Jerusalem will be the center of his world government. I told you when we got back from Israel that uh, the first day we were there, before our groups got there, we were staying at the Sheraton Hotel in Jerusalem the day that President Bush came in. He arrived in a little different way than Darlene and I did, but he came in. And we watched 14,000 security guards and militia clear the way for him, right underneath our balcony. When King Jesus sweeps in, nobody's going to bother him. There won't have to be a guard. Nobody will even have a water pistol. Jerusalem will be the center of his world government. The lifespan of man will increase with those born during this time who commit their lives to Christ living for the entire time, while non-believers will not exceed 100 years of living, probably. The economics of those years will be stable and beneficial to all. Economics are not too stable right now. We're complaining about $4 and, what, $0.06 gasoline. In Greece, two weeks ago, they were paying $8.20 for gasoline. Somewhere else I read yesterday, they're paying $10 and something a gallon for gasoline. In Venezuela, they're paying $0.19 cents a gallon for gasoline. I would not say we have a real stable economy. And beneficial to all. The curse will be lifted from the animal kingdom with all living peaceably together and no threat to mankind. For those of you who don't know it, I have a lion in my office. I've got a stuffed lion in my office. From time to time, I've had any number of strange creatures in my office. Had a live alligator in there one time that I was keeping for a friend of mine who used to own pet land. And he had a pet alligator wasn't real big, maybe like that, named Elvis. And he called me one day and said, will you take care of Elvis over the weekend? I'm going out of town. And I said, sure. So I went to his house and picked Elvis up, put him in the back seat of my car, and, um, and drove him. I had to go somewhere, and so I thought, well, I'll just put him in my office temporarily. <laughs> and I did. And Shirley Young, dear Shirley Young, whom you may think is up in years, but she's not. She's only 27. 
It was after this experience that she aged so badly. Shirley was filling in as my secretary for a while, and I honestly, had my hand on this book, I forgot to tell her that Elvis was in the, and she opened the door and Elvis whirled around and whoosh, and uh, Shirley quit. I just love wild animals. I just, I mean, if you've seen our Noah production, I really love animals. Someday they'll live with no threat whatsoever. That'll be neat. Then the great white throne judgment comes along. You've seen heaven's gates and hell's flames presented here about 150 times, literally, on this platform over the years. Verses 11 to 15 tell us of the time when the lost stand before God. They'll be judged on whether or not their name is written in the book of life and by the books that tell of their works. We have books of works too, you know. We save people. But those things that we have done that are contrary to God have all been blotted out by the blood of the Lamb and cannot be remembered against us anymore. Praise the Lord. Okay, now we're going to chapter 21. I want to move right along with this. The new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, chapter 21. Read along or watch the screen. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth had disappeared, and so had the sea. Then I saw New Jerusalem, that holy city, coming down from God in heaven. It was like a bride, dressed in her wedding gown, and ready to meet her husband. I heard a loud voice shout from the throne, God's home is now with his people. He will live with them, and they will be his own. Yes, God will make his home among his people. He will wipe all tears from their eyes, and there will be no more death, suffering, crying, or pain. These things of the past are gone forever. Then the one sitting on the throne said, I am making everything new. Write down what I have said. My words are true and can be trusted. Everything is finished. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will freely give water from the life-giving fountain to everyone who is thirsty. All who win the victory will be given these blessings. I will be their God, and they will be my people. But I will tell you what will happen to cowards and to everyone who is unfaithful or dirty-minded or who murders or is sexually immoral or uses witchcraft or worships idols or tells lies. They will be thrown into that lake of fire and burning sulfur. This is the second death. I saw one of the seven angels who had the bowls filled with the seven last terrible troubles. The angel came to me and said, come on. I will show you the one who will be the bride and wife of the Lamb. Then with the help of the Spirit, he took me to the top of a very high mountain. There he showed me the holy city of Jerusalem coming down from God in heaven. The glory of God made the city bright. It was dazzling and crystal clear like a precious jasper stone. The city had a high and thick wall with 12 gates, and each one of them was guarded by an angel. 
each of the gates was written the name of one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Three of these gates were on the east, three were on the north, three more were on the south, and the other three were on the west. The city was built on 12 foundation stones. On each of the stones was written the name of one of the Lamb's 12 apostles. The angel who spoke to me had a gold measuring stick to measure the city and its gates and its walls. The city was shaped like a cube because it was just as high as it was wide. When the angel measured the city, it was about 1,500 miles high and 1,500 miles wide. Then the angel measured the wall, and by our measurements, it was about 216 feet high. The wall was built of jasper, and the city was made of pure gold, clear as crystal. Each of the 12 foundations was a precious stone. The first was jasper, the second was sapphire, the third was agate, the fourth was emerald, the fifth was onyx, the sixth was carnelian, the seventh was chrysolite, the eighth was beryl, the ninth was topaz, the tenth was chrysoprase. The eleventh was Jason, and the twelfth was Amethyst. Each of the twelve gates was a solid pearl. The streets of the city were made of pure gold, clear as crystal. I did not see a temple there. The Lord God all-powerful and the Lamb were its temple. And the city did not need the sun or the moon. The glory of God was shining on it, and the Lamb was its light. Nations will walk by the light of that city, and kings will bring their riches there. Its gates are always open during the day, and night never comes. The glorious treasures of nations will be brought into the city. But nothing unworthy will be allowed to enter. No one who is dirty-minded or who tells lies will be there. Only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life will be in the city. So it's not some preacher who made an arbitrary ruling that this had to be done or that had to be done in order to have eternal life. God said it. It's his city. It's his creation, and he can choose who comes in and who doesn't. You notice in verse 4, it was at this point, God wipes away all tears from their eyes. No more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall be there any more pain, for the former things are passed away. If Jesus came at this very moment the fulfillment of that verse is still over a thousand years away. We do have tears. We do have pain. The fact that you and I are followers of Christ does not mean that we are immune to the difficulties of life. But one day God will wipe away every tear and there'll be no more crying, no more pain. Praise the Lord. Notice on line four, page eight, God's going to destroy the heavens, that is the atmosphere, because they have been contaminated by Satan's influence. On line 12, Ephesians 6, 12 refers to the God of this earth whose emissaries are performing spiritual wickedness in high places. God's going to eliminate all sources of evil from our lives. In this purging process, God will create a brand new earth. Nothing in scripture that says the earth will be the same size as it is now. It could be smaller, it could be infinitely larger. It does not say he's going to duplicate it. He says there'll be a new one. Only a small part of our earth right now is inhabitable because 70% of it's covered by water. Remember the first time I ever flew across the Atlantic, that would have been in 
71 maybe. It wasn't very wide. We went across it in no time. But coming back across it a couple weeks ago, it's about 200,000 miles across there. That's the way it seems to me. We just flew and 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 flew. When you're going five, six hundred miles an hour and it takes you ten hours to get across an ocean, that's a long way and the seats are harder and and the peanuts are drier. That's kind of a strange verse, there'd be no more sea. I love the ocean very much, but no more sea as compared to what it is now. Is there, will there be no oceans at all? Will there be no dividing? It doesn't say that about rivers. It does say there'll be rivers. Got to be farm ponds that got brim and catfish in them, I would hope. But about the sea, that's, that's, very, that's a very strange one. Now John describes the new Jerusalem, line 23. One of the seven angels who held the seven bowls containing the seven last plagues came and said to me, come with me, I'll show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. Now the city is not the bride, but the city is filled with the bride. You and I are the bride of Christ. So he took me in the spirit to a great high mountain. He showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. It was filled with glory. The glory of God sparkled like a precious gem, crystal clear like jasper. I jotted down some observations about this place. Line 33, it has a wall around it. Now apparently the New Jerusalem settles down to this earth. Or is it going to be some intermediary place? Theologians are divided on that thing. But there's going to be a wall around it. Not everyone will have access to God. The wall will not be for protection of the city, but to keep out anyone whom God does not want there in his presence. The city apparently will rest somewhere on this newly created earth, many people think. There'll be 12 gates to the city, always open for God's people. The foundations of the city are extravagant. This is from Dr. John Walbert. Jasper, which is gold in appearance, a sapphire, a stone similar to a diamond, blue in color, chalcedony, an agate stone from Chalcedon in Turkey, thought to be sky blue with other colors running through it. Emerald, a bright green color. Sardonyx, red and white stone. Sardius, a jewel of reddish color. Chrysolite, transparent with a golden hue. Burl, which is sea green. Topaz, yellow green and transparent. Chrysopris is another shade of green, jacinth, violent, amethyst, purple in its most common form. The precise color of these stones are designed to reflect the glory of God in a spectrum of brilliant color. The light of the city will then shining through these various colors in the foundation of the wall, topped by the wall itself, composed of crystal clear jasper, forms a scene of dazzling beauty in keeping with the glory of God and the beauty of his holiness. It's going to be absolutely gorgeous. Now it's going to be a big place. Remember, it's not just, uh, it's not just width and height. It's also, uh, not width and length, it's also height. It's cubed because we have spiritual bodies. We have glorified, resurrected bodies. Space will mean nothing to us. Dimensions that limit us today, if you don't have an elevator, <clears throat> you know, you don't go very high anymore. And uh, I remember we stayed one time, Darlene and I, at the Sheraton in, uh, in Jerusalem, we were on, or in, uh, in Brussels, and we were on the 17th floor. And this has been a long time ago. And many times I'd just hike up the 17 floors. I wouldn't. I wouldn't hike up 17 floors to see the Apostle Paul, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> if there's not an elevator there, I ain't going. But in eternity, we have bodies that don't have physics limitations. So the cube, which you and I can't really comprehend here, will just mean nothing to us. In dimensions we can understand, 1,500 miles, most versions say, the, the uh, 
scripture reading I gave you, I think, said 1,400 miles, but it's 1,500 miles. If a cubit is 18 inches. In dimensions we can understand, east to west, the city would run from Tallahassee, Florida, in one direction to the Arizona state line, and then north to James Bay in northern Ontario. Plus, it would be 1,500 miles high. Try to imagine that much room. Tim LaHaye said, can you imagine the view from your apartment house overlooking the holy city and extending as far as the eye can see from an elevation of 1,500 miles? Not 1,500 feet, 1,500 miles. Also noteworthy about the holy city, each of the gates is a single pearl. The streets will be pure gold. Gold right now is what? I don't know, $1,000 an ounce, $1,100 an ounce, something like that. They're, they're redoing Summerlin down here. Just try to imagine the big machine just spewing out gold and they're tamping it. <laughs> I love that. Jewelers aren't going to like that. There'll be no temple in the city following the millennium and the new creation because God himself will be with mankind. And the limit for those who have access to the city, nothing evil will be allowed to enter. No one who practices shameful idolatry and dishonesty, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now we come to the finale, chapter 22. Watch the screen. The angel showed me a river that was crystal clear and its waters gave life. The river came from the throne where God and the Lamb were seated, and it flowed down the middle of the city's main street. On each side of the river are trees that grow a different kind of fruit each month of the year. The fruit gives life, and the leaves are used as medicine to heal the nations. God's curse will no longer be on the people of that city. He and the Lamb will be seated there on their thrones. And its people will worship God and will see Him face to face. God's name will be written on the foreheads of the people. Never again will night appear, and no one who lives there will ever need a lamp or the sun. Lord God will be their light, and they will rule forever. Then I was told, these words are true and can be trusted. The Lord God controls the spirits of his prophets, and he is the one who sent his angel to show his servants what must happen right away. Remember, I am coming soon. God will bless everyone who pays attention to the message of this book. My name is John, and I am the one who heard and saw these things. Then after I had heard and seen all this, I knelt down and began to worship at the feet of the angel who had shown it to me. But the angel said, don't do that. I am a servant just like you. I am the same as a follower or a prophet or anyone else who obeys what is written in this book. God is the one you should worship. Don't keep the prophecies in this book a secret. These things will happen soon. Evil people will keep on being evil and everyone who is dirty-minded will still be dirty-minded. But good people will keep on doing right, and God's people will always be holy. Then I was told, I am coming soon. When I come, I will reward everyone for what they have done. Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, beginning and the end. 
God will bless all who have washed their robes. They will each have the right to eat fruit from the tree that gives life, and they can enter the gates of the city. But outside the city will be dogs, witches, immoral people, murderers, idol worshippers, and everyone who loves to tell lies and do wrong. Jesus, and I am the one who sent my angel to tell all of you these things for the churches. I am David's great descendant, and I am also the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. Everyone who hears this should say, If you are thirsty, come. If you want life-giving water, come and take it. It's free. Here is my warning for everyone who hears the prophecies in this book. If you add anything to them, God will make you suffer all the terrible troubles written in this book. If you take anything away from these prophecies, God will not let you have part in the life-giving tree and in the holy city described in this book. The one who has spoken these things says, I am coming soon. So, Lord Jesus, please come soon. I pray that the Lord Jesus will be kind to all of you. Everybody said amen. All right, we learn in this chapter, this final chapter from the very first verse about the water, the river of life, clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. Apparently, even in eternity, we're going to need water, the pure river of water of life. Then we learn about the tree of life, which was forbidden in Genesis. But now as we get to the book of Revelation, we find that it blesses the redeemed in eternity. Its leaves are for the healing of the people. Uh, don't take that to mean that in eternity in heaven you're going to get sick and have to go munch on a branch to get well. That's not what that means. It means that we're going to have eternal health. God has provided eternal health, eternal life all throughout heaven. No sickness, no more curse. The curse upon mankind was lifted at Calvary. We are redeemed from the curse of the law, we read about in the New Testament. For those who come to Christ, the curse on the earth was fulfilled just a little earlier than this chapter when God created a new heaven, destroyed this one as we know it by fire, Peter tells us. The curse on Satan is being fulfilled as we read this because he's now in hell forever and ever. So the curses are lifted. We read, the very throne of God will be with us, and we shall see his face. Praise the Lord. There will be no night there, no darkness, no darkness. Does that mean it's all going to be in brilliant sunlight all the time and we won't have any shade? I don't think so. It just means there's no need of the sun. It didn't say there wouldn't be the sun. It said they're not necessary. You know, the sun which is 93 million miles away from us and which is vast. You could drop the earth in the sun and never even find the hole. The sun is one of the tiniest stars in the universe. Our sun is dwarfed unbelievably by any number of other suns in the universe. Well, how do they catch fire to begin with? Well, once upon a time, boys and girls, 
there were just a whole lot of chemicals that were out of place, and there was a <laughs> and it all happened. Boy, you got to really have faith to believe that. It's like the guy who got a whole lot of watch parts put together and put them in a big barrel and put a bomb under them, a little long fuse. His friend said, what are you doing? He said, I'm going to set this bomb off underneath all this barrel full of watch parts. I'm going to make me a Rolex. <laughs> Man. We shall reign with God forever and ever. Now, what to look for in eternity? I love this from Dr. Pentecost, his book, Things to Come, which is, you ought to have that in your library. A life of fellowship with God, and then you read all those wonderful scriptures. We don't see things clearly. King James says, now we see through a glass darkly. We're squinting in a fog, peering through a mist. But it won't be long before the weather clears and the sun shines bright. 1 John 3, 2, but friends, that's exactly who we are, children of God, and that's only the beginning. Who knows how we'll end up? What we know is that when Christ is openly revealed, we'll see him, and in seeing him, become like him. This is from the message, John 14, 3. Remember, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. I love this from the message. And if I'm on, if I'm on my way to get your room ready, I'll come back and get you so you can see where I live. I like that. Revelation 22, 4, they'll look on his face. Praise God. It's going to be a life of rest. Revelation 14, 13, blessed are those who die in the master from now on. How blessed, how blessed to die that way. Yes, it's going to be a life full of knowledge. I don't know about you, but the older I get, the more curious I get. And and the more difficult books I tend to read. I don't read C. Dick and Jane Jump anymore. Oh, oh, C. Jim Jump. Mm-mm. I don't read those anymore. I like to read more difficult books that take me into ways that I've never been before because <clears throat> it's my feeling, only my feeling, this is not theology, that your mind is a part of your soul and that the closer it gets to eternity, um, all things being equal health-wise, the more agile your mind should become. I read on the Internet today about a guy who just died at 115, and who was so smart at the age of 115. His knowledge was breathtaking. I really believe the older we get, health notwithstanding, the more our minds uh, prepare like where we're going. Somebody said the older you get, the more you become like the place where you're heading up. Think about that. So it's going to be a life full of knowledge. Then I'm going on, who wants to be a millionaire? <laughs> it's going to be a life of holiness. That means a life of moral health. Nothing dirty or defiled will get into the city. It's going to be a life of joy. Revelation 21, 4, he'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. It's going to be a life of service. Revelation 22, 3. His servants will offer God service. They will worship him. You don't want to just sit on a cloud and strum a harp for a billion years. You'd go nuts. Especially when you now have a mind and soul and spirit totally resurrected, glorified, and redeemed. Man, you want to do stuff. You want to get busy. Well, Pastor, won't we just stand around the throne forever and ever and ever and ever and sing choruses? Dear God, I hope not. <laughs> we'll sing and praise the Lord for a long time, as Revelation 4 tells us, but then we're going to be busy. It's going to be a life full of service. It's going to be a life of abundance, Revelation 21, 6. It's going to be a life of glory. Line 26 there from Colossians, when Christ, your real life, shows up again on earth, you'll show up too, the real you, the glorious you. It's going to be a life of worship. I saw a large crowd too huge to count. All nations and tribes, races and languages. 
dressed in white robes, waving palm branches, standing before the throne of the Lamb and singing salvation to our God on his throne, salvation to the Lamb. And all who were standing around the throne, angels, elders, animals, and that word animals is really, that's from the seraphs, those great six-winged massive seraphim that fly over the throne of God, fall on their faces before God. Look at the last page now, line 9. Christ's reminder of his return, Revelation 22, 7. I come quickly. The word quickly should be translated suddenly. It's like that. Quickly does not mean in such and such a length of time he will come. It means that when he comes, you're out of here. Praise God. And with that, John writes the last invitation to mankind. Verse 17, the spirit and the bride. The bride is the church, remember? The Holy Spirit and the church link up here in these last days, saying to the world, come. We're in the missionary business, people. No mistake about that. Come. Let him that heareth say, come. Let him that is a thirst, come. And whosoever will, will take, let him take of the water of life freely. I have never in my whole life met anyone who I thought had ever crossed some line they could never get across again. I was asked two questions more than any other in the 17 years on Revival Time. Number one, who's the Antichrist? I don't know. What's the unpardonable sin? I believe it's dying without Christ because Jesus said nobody can come to the Father except the Holy Spirit draws him. And the ultimate blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is to die without Christ in your heart. Hebrews says it's appointed unto man to die and after that the judgment. No, no, pastor, there's a sin where nobody can ever get saved again. Then what are you going to do with this verse? Whosoever will may come. If your want to now, somebody's want to may be rusted out. But anybody who wants to come, don't ever tell anybody they've committed the unpardonable sin. You'll put a guilt trip on them from which they'll be lucky to recover. Anybody who wants to come to Christ can come. Feelings have nothing to do with it. We're justified by faith. If God says I can come and I want to come, then I can come into his presence. I can be born again. There is no sin so great that it cannot be covered by the blood of Jesus. Jesus didn't die on the cross and cry out, it's partially finished, I couldn't get it all done. He said, it's finished. And anybody who wants to be saved can be saved. Hallelujah. Whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Praise God. He which testifieth these things saith, I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Tim LaHaye wrote, every individual wants happiness. The way to eternal happiness is to receive Christ as Lord and Savior, which entitles you to entrance into the holy city, access to the tree of life, and the marvelous blessings of a loving God. As your pastor, I encourage you to be sure that you know, that you know, that you know, that you're right with God. Receive Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior today. Membership to a church is not what God's looking for here. He's looking for those people who know Jesus as their Savior. Jesus said, I am the way. The other day, a very famous TV hostess said, don't say Jesus is the only way. What are you going to do with all those people around the world who don't know anything about Christianity? Well, that's what she may think, but Jesus said, I am the way. So you'll have to decide who you're pinning your hopes on. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh to the Father but by me. This is why missions is so incredibly important. We're, we're asked a lot of times, well, what's God going to do about these people who have never heard? That's not our business. Our business is to obey the Great Commission and make sure everybody does hear. And in these days of phenomenal, phenomenal outreach potential, everybody ought to. Well, we made it through that, folks, didn't we? 
Praise the Lord. Only took four months, four months to do it. And next week we start that whole new series. Boy, I hope you'll join me. It's going to be so much fun. Pastor, will it be as exciting as the book of Revelation? It's Scripture. It's Scripture. And I can absolutely get into the Old Testament and stay there for months. We're going to have so much fun. The other day, I'll tell you this and I'll let you go. The other day, <clears throat> you know, when, when David conquered Jerusalem, uh, he didn't, he, the city of Jerusalem, as you know it today, David didn't know anything about. Jerusalem, starting from the north, goes down like this, and then it just plummets down like this into the Kidron Valley. And David lived way down there in the valley, in that little town known today as Silwan. He was way down there. And he used to look up and he'd see that summit up there, and he thought that looked so great. But it had to be conquered from the Jebusites who owned it. He got a threshing floor, but the whole city of Jerusalem he didn't get. So I took the whole bunch of us, all 84 of us, down by the spring Gihon, down on, way down on that south end where Hezekiah got his water from later. And we made our way down through a wedge in the rocks, deep inside the bowels of the earth, where there were places where you turned sideways and your tummy and your little backside hit both sides of the wall. And where it was about this high, and we scraped through it and parts of it are pretty dark and it's very wet. Say, why did you take them down there? Because they just needed it. <laughs> and we got way down inside there, but there was a reason I wanted them to go down there. Way down inside that place, you come to a shaft about this big, straight up and down. It's probably 30, 40 feet straight up and down. And way down below, it's the spring gilm. And the Jebusites used to take their women. They had women's rights had very strong back in those days, as David Osiel told us, and the women had the right to get the water. <laughs> what? And they would go down there with these water pots and they'd pull them up with ropes. That's how they got their water. But when David and his men came way down below there, they could look up that shaft and the Jebusites mocked them. And they said, we could put one person up here who was blind and lame and hold you off, David. There's no way you can get up here. So David said, any of my men who can find a way up that shaft, I'll make commander in chief of my armies. And a guy named Joab said, hey, I can do that. went to that shaft, and that's one of the stories we're going to study. <laughs> Is that right, Tom? You were there. Marcy, you were there. <laughs> if you have victory in your heart, stand up with me.